I'd like to welcome you all to the Bunkey Clinic Virtual Visiting Professor Series. Uh, along with all my partners at the Bunkey Clinic, we're delighted this afternoon or this evening to uh, welcome a very dear friend of, of mine and also a very dear, dear friend of the clinic, Dr. Jamie Levine from NYU. Um, Jamie is, uh, the, uh, is an associate professor and the chief of microsurgery at the Hans Borgwitz Department of uh, Plastic Surgery um, at the NYU School of Medicine. A couple of uh, uh, slides just as a uh, um, brief uh, background. Um, Dr. Levine is a native New Yorker. He was born and raised there, and so he's kind of stuck around through medical school and general surgery as well. And then in plastic surgery, he was at NYU, and he stayed there for his microsurgery fellowship and obviously stayed there on staff. So I've uh, been at NYU for quite some time now. I had the, um, the pleasure to visit Dr. Levine and his colleagues last year, and it was really a phenomenal trip. I hadn't been there in the Department of Plastic Surgery since I was inter interviewing for residency, so it had been quite some time. Um, and I was very impressed with what Dr. Rodriguez has built. Um, uh, they basically have a dedicated uh, cadaver lab uh, for the residents. Uh, and this is basically just completely owned by plastic surgery. And it, and it was really a phenomenal time. They had a whole cadaver for us. And I spent a good amount of time with the residents um, dissecting a number of flaps from head to toe. I think the most memorable part of the trip was that Dr. Levine um, and Dr. Rachel Bluebon Langner, which you see on the right here, were kind enough to actually get me temporary privileges um, to basically scrub in and, and essentially watch them in action. It was really phenomenal uh, watching a true master at work. Um, and Jamie does microsurgery from head to toe, and he's equally comfortable from the head all the way to the toe. And so it was really fun to, to scrub in and see him in action. But also just on a personal level, I think he's um, not only a dear friend, but a phenomenal host, and he arranged for a very nice dinner um, the, that night as well. So it's was, it was really, really fun, tr fun trip. Jamie, thanks again for uh, being such a great host when I was uh, uh, visiting you in New York City. And it's really an honor and a pleasure to have you. And we're really looking forward to your, uh, to your talk today. Uh, well, it's, it's truly an honor. I'm, uh, I'm sorry that uh, things didn't uh, go more seamlessly, but I think we're here finally. And it's really an honor to be asked. It's an honor to join you guys. I mean, I'm humbled by this and uh, you know your words are way too kind and um, well, hopefully we can have a little fun here um, you know please if there's any point you're not hearing anything or something's problematic or you want to ask anything just let me know great thanks Jamie I just made your presenter so you should be able to uh, share your screen again with us okay let, you know what let me um, hold on a second I'm going to go uh, screen, share, okay, share. Now, a question for you. Does the computer that you're on, does it have a webcam? If not, it's not a big deal. Uh, you know, sir, I'm not on it. I don't, uh, it may not. It's a no hospital-based computer. No so problem. So I think I may be, I think I may be a little uh, no shy problem. here. Are you seeing me? Yeah, I see the PowerPoint. Um, it's not quite uh, in presentation mode yet, but uh, if you go full screen on the presenter, we should be able to see that. Okay, yeah, and then you, we'll get need to this. Do, yeah, exactly. Yep. Perfect. All right. Great, thank you. So, all right. So, um, if we're ready, just tell me if um, anything's lagging or there's any issues, but um, sure, I'd like I'll to talk about Okay, what I'd like to talk about today or this evening um, is sort of in my eyes the evolution of jaw reconstruction utilizing digital technology. I'm fortunate to have been involved in this. As, as you said, I'm, uh, I guess I'm, maybe it's uh, ADHD or whatever it's called nowadays, but I definitely don't find myself contained to one part of the body, but I definitely have a tremendous interest probably for, for three-dimensional reasons and uh, technical reasons in the uh, the jaw, jaw reconstruction, head and neck reconstruction in general. Jamie, um, sorry to inter interrupt you. Would you mind clicking yeah. on the hide, um, on the banner down below? If you click on hide, it'll go away. Yes, so go away. I'm sorry. Oh, no you worries. got it. Thanks so much. Okay. So I've been somewhat obsessed with uh, surgical accuracy. Um, it, it was my, I remember my former chief, Dr. McCarthy, used to say the biggest change he saw in his career was imaging. Uh, CT is basically plain films and CT uh, scans came about 
3D imaging. I think he said this really changed how he viewed and was able to perform his own um, his own uh, procedures. You know, he's a craniofacial surgeon, so it's a very three dimensional sort of um, uh, field. Um, and we're, what we're seeing now is an evolution in technology and the ability to translate this uh, into in imaging and take that imaging and create tangible models. Um, we're getting new tools to use for reconstruction. And basically, I think as software becomes more user-friendly and as rapid prototyping happens, we're going to be able to do things sort of more in real time uh, and be able to use imaging in real time to help our um, our own surgical procedures. And we're seeing this in these hybrid rooms and everything vascular has sort of changed with this and even um, many uh, many components of cardiac surgery have even changed with this. So we have the ability now to preoperatively plan and deliver very reproducible and accurate surgical outcomes better than ever before. And you know, I've seen this sort of in my career um, the evolution of this in head and neck surgery is sort of a very good um, sort of window into this. It's transformed the oncologic, orthognathic, trauma, craniofacial, and head and neck uh, components, even uh, made its way into our orthopedic reconstructions. My partner um, is doing this regularly with the orthopedic oncologists, and I think it's becoming part of reconstruction in general. Um, I'm going to discuss the evolution of these methods from sort of idea to application. Um, the technology continues to advance, and this is going to allow us more accuracy um, in all forms of tissue, uh, including the soft tissues in the future. I think that's our sort of next uh, frontier. Um, Real-time imaging, robotic surgical approaches, offering potential evolution, surgical visualization, really just as laparoscopy did 20 or 30 years ago in uh, general surgery. And I, um, sort of saw that uh, evolution uh, as I trained um, from coming from medical school into general surgery itself. Um, this is guidance technology. You know, we're able to sort of use this for accuracy, and I think it needs to be taken into plastic surgery more. This is a patient who had a lesion that was removed, and basically um, there was a portion of it that was left. Um, it was not palpable. It was not findable, sort of came up with the concept for the oncologic surgeon instead of sort of cutting away a large portion of his upper back, let's see if we can image this and they can see it on the uh, MR. And we were able to use this to help us guide um, the surgery in that procedure. Um, but it's isolated. You know, soft tissue is very difficult, but it is very good for bony reconstruction. And this is a patient of ours early on. Uh, when we were using um, modeling and guidance, and we were able to sort of hook up um, and plan out this patient's surgery. It was a 10-year-old uh, patient who was unoperated um, microsomia, and we planned a very complex reconstruction, including placing um, a fibula as a chondral segment all the way up into a fossa that didn't exist. So we really needed to make sure that we got it there. It was really a blind approach. Facial nerve was around there somewhere and uh, not in normal and anatomic position. We needed to make sure that we were getting it in the right position. So we put on this um, striker at that point uh, system and used our various guides and models. And you can see in this component, once the uh, resection and uh, movement was made, we then were, needed to fit the fibula up. And this is us placing the fibula into position. And Sort of using the modeling, uh, the guidance technology to show us that we're in the right position. And this is in post operatively. Um, here's sort of real time CT, now portable, able to bring this into the operating room. Our hospital just um, opened ORs that have MR scan built into it. So the technology is coming to us. We have to be willing to accept it and utilize it. I've sort of also gotten involved in robotic surgery. I think this is another way of sort of accurately delivering uh, reconstructive options in uh, the situation that I'm faced with where my colleagues are doing robotic surgery. And if they're doing resections uh, in the pelvis or they're trying to do um, reconstructions within spaces that used to be open, 
uh, I'm able to get in there now and uh, and help them with the reconstructive component of it instead of sort of having to change the plan of the uh, operation fully. And this is just showing sort of um, the in and out component of uh, robotic uh, surgery and us placing sort of a flap and giving it to them in, uh, internally and being able to position that and suture that into position very accurately. And this is something that we weren't able to do in the past. I think, you know, visualization in the pelvis and other areas, even in the thoracic cavity, was always limited by access. And now the access is being given by um, the robot and sort of specialized visualization. And, you know, I think it behooves us to get involved and sort of be on the forefront of sort of delivering tissue and figuring out ways of operating within these spaces and using this technology. So in head and neck reconstruction, this is what we were faced with. You know, these are the forgotten patients, you know, bad tumors, horrible uh, location. Um, and reconstruction lagged behind the ability to resect. And I think ultimately reconstruction has allowed resection to advance. You know, here's the historic Andy Gump, um, uh, which, uh, you know, is something we never want to see in this day and age, which is the non-appearance of the jaw, the loss of the lower face. Um, these are the giants. These are the people that sort of evolved the um, uh, and advanced the um, head, field of head and neck reconstruction. And you can see where it came from, you know, sort of free bone grafting, of course, the limitations that are built into that, cortical cancellus. And then all of a sudden, there was the evolution of flaps local flaps, pectoralis flaps, rotation flaps, um, osseous, osseomyocutaneous flaps, and ultimately microvascular uh, free tissue transfer, which really sort of uh, started probably in the 70s and got popularized in the 80s and 90s, and it's become sort of, I'd say, the mainstay for us uh, and the gold standard for us in uh, this day and age. And I think in the 2000s, what we're seeing is the advancement of that where we're taking um, free tissue and we're using computer-aided technology to help guide us into the most accurate possible reconstructions uh, to date. This is where we could get tissue from, various places, multiple places. So we use all of these, or at least um, many of these, for head and neck reconstruction. And certainly, if you're doing head and neck reconstruction, you should be versed in all of these uh, components. Um, the fibula still for bony reconstruction is my workhorse flap. It's uh, the one I like to use most. I uh, use it probably well over 90% of the time. doesn't mean that there aren't other options for other situations. And I'll show some examples later on, but it's certainly the one that provides us uh, the greatest flexibility, long bone, uh, cuttable, osteotomizable, um, you know, to help it bend and reconstruct very three-dimensional defects a long vascular pedicle. It really helps us replace like tissue with like, helps us create uh, more of a single stage reconstruction. It resists or is good for radiotherapy. It has it's very reliable, including skin paddle, and it helps us to restore adequate occlusion, mastication, speech, et cetera. In head and neck reconstruction, when, certainly when I started in plastic surgery, um, there were tremendous opportunities for error. Um, my goal when I started was just to get the flap to live, never mind getting it in a position that was going to be ultimately usable. I mean, you know, the era where I started, the head and neck surgeons would sort of flew on their own. They would just resect and do this uh, based off of what they found intraoperatively. The scans didn't necessarily mean anything. The plan didn't mean anything. They would resect and sort of walk out of the room and you were left with um, uh, pieces of uh, mandible that was swinging in the breeze. This is uh, sort of a picture and then a shown uh, mandibulotomy uh, approach. And really when you do a resection, all of a sudden the condyles are freely floating. Um, the bone segments are pretty floating, and trying to get this back 
into an orthognathically appropriate position so that someone could then get teeth, have uh, appropriate uh, speech and swallow was almost a Herculean task. Um, so you sorry, we started thinking of ways of trying to do this better. Um, so, you know, this is just showing another example where like half the jaw is taken out. And when you're faced with this, how do you go and reconstruct it? Well, you, you know, experience, um, there are people who've done this for years and years and they're able to figure this out, um, but it's still difficult. And, you know, um, when I started in plastic surgery, I spent many, many hours just trying to put this back together, bend plates to fit into this situation. I pleaded with my head and neck on uh, colleagues to allow me to try and do things before they made their osteotomies. But again, it always led to um, the position of like, what I felt was not optimal and trying to get uh, a bad situation better. So we started trying to bend plates to the native mandible. Uh, and this is great when you have the chance to do it before the cuts are made. Once the cut's made, then the muscle's gonna pull the mandible, the jaw into uh, the position it wants to pull it in. And getting that back, just if anyone's done, has done uh, mandible fractures, you know, is takes sort of a good amount of effort, knowledge, and experience in getting the pieces back together. You want to have the teeth in alignment. Um, sometimes in cases like like ours, there aren't teeth to work with. So all of these are very difficult um, things to uh, work around. And you know, being able to use the native jaw when it was able to bend a plate all of a sudden gave us the ability to. Um, allow them to do the resection and then come back after the plate was uh, taken off and put the plate back on. And now at least I could fit the fibula into uh, the desired puzzle shape that I needed. Except you can't do that when this is the case. When you have a fungating lesion, you can't necessarily expose the bone. You're just going to have to resect this and uh, do the best you can. We developed other techniques, and this is a paper from Marchetti showing and sort of an external fixator type of uh, approach where you create the plate around the defect, um, sort of like an external fixator, uh, resect, and then plate again. This is just showing an example of this here is, uh, was a fungating lesion. We plated um, the away from the tumor, so this is the uh, ramal segment coming around to the uh, symphysis, resected, then bent the plate to the desired position, and then we were able to fit the fibula within that. And you can see at least, you know, for me, if I didn't, hadn't done this, uh, trying to reconstruct this and facing this without having this alignment would have been extraordinarily difficult. But at least this gave me a, a template to work by and uh, fit the fibula in. You could also see that even with that, sometimes, Bone contact was difficult. You know, here the fibula should be up a little bit higher. We want good bone contact for um, appropriate osteosynthesis. And it's just hard to do all of these points together in free space um, when, you know, you're not necessarily in the most ideal situation. Um, we started trying to use templates, and this is nothing new. Um, people have uh, done this for uh, a long period of time using even cutouts from uh, old uh, x-ray film and trying to bend this around and pre-template um, plates in the bone. And we were, would eventually just bend the plate, cut the uh, ruler guide or whatever um, other stable uh, structure we had to fit in so we could create the wedge osteotomies and then at least two-dimensionally we would be able to get the shape that we needed and then we'd whittle away and try to get the uh, fibula to fit into position. We'd try to come up with ways of uh, sort of situating this. I would take the plate off from the head and neck, sort of flash it, bring it down to the leg, score it, try to fit it on again trying to decrease the, for myself the amount of uh, ischemia time because it took a short, I took a large amount of whittling to get these pieces to fit together. And, um, you know, anything that would help is what we tried to do. But, you know, you could still come out with good 
um, reconstruction. And it, I thought this was a home run uh, when we did this. Um, you know, we got the bone in good position. We got good osteotomies. You know, weren't taking anything into account regarding uh, implants or ultimate uh, dentition down the line. And even the contour of the lower portion of the jaw, we really didn't take into account. We, again, we're just trying to get the bone into good position, get it to live, get the intraoral um, cutaneous or, my, uh, or mucosal closure appropriate and, and, and get the patient on to further treatment. Then came sort of stereolithographic models. You know, this was, it was a, just, it was a unique thing. It was fun to have these models, but they didn't really have any real utility. You know, we would get these printed and they'd have all, you know, sort of mainly in for craniofacial issues and you'd know, see what a cruzon looked like or you'd see what an Apertz patient looked like. But then we started getting these, uh, for actual, um, cases. And what you could do is bend the plate so you could start doing pre-surgical uh, treatment. Again, this didn't tell us exactly where the oncologic surgeon was going to cut, but if we overplanned it and we made it so that at least we were in the realm where we could fit the plate on, this is starting to give us more accuracy. And you can see a pre-bent plate, and again, we were able to fit the fibula to this, and give, it gave us a better reconstruction. But you have to sort of keep your mind open at all times, and you know we needed to evolve with that. And down here, you can see this is—I uh, don't know if you see my pointer, but there's Evan Garfine and Dave Staffenberg. And I was just fortunate to know Dave is a very close friend, going back to general surgical training. He was chief of uh, plastic surgery in Montefiore at the time. Evan Garfine was my fellow, and he saw the difficulties in sort of putting these fibulas together. He invested a lot of time, as I did and trying to figure out better and better ways. And we had good colleagues that we worked with. And he was uh, going uh, for a job actually to Montefiore. And Dave at that time was uh, working with the um, uh, conjoint twins and then a tremendous amount of technology that was being brought in there. And one of them was a company that was doing printing for the skulls. And basically, and Evan going over there and talking with them, he realized that you know, they said, well, we could print guides if you need and do all sorts of stuff. And and that was like a light bulb moment. And well, guides, that could be like a jig, a cutting guide. A cutting guide could tell us three-dimensionally how we need to cut, you know, a two-dimensional structure and make it bend the way we wanted it to. This was like an epiphany. And that's exactly what we did. We kind of hooked up with that company. And our first goal was to see if we could just plan a surgery. Next was to create cutting guides to see if we could perform just a three-dimensional wedge osteotomy. After that, and we showed that, we wanted to see if we could create guides to help cut the jaw. Because now, now that we could show that we can make it through the three-dimensional structure accurately, then we needed to get their head and neck colleagues to buy into this. If they could plan their part, then we were golden. Then we could at least now uh, create a situation where we could cut the bone in the, the leg and we could cut the bone in the jaw and we get those pieces to marry together. So we went about doing that and we looked at our first bunch of patients. We looked at the planning phases, modeling phases, surgical phase, evaluation phase of it. This is just showing early on uh, the images from when we did our planning sessions. These were the very early guides that we got. Uh, we print out the jaw, the fibula that, that was desired in position, the cutting guide for the jaw and the cutting guide for the leg. I mean, it's this was a huge leap for us. Now I look at it as being very simple and it's sort of like very rudimentary, but it was a, a huge leap forward for us in accuracy. And this is showing an early case. And you can see we still sort of X fixed it, but then, made the osteotomy on the jaw and here's the guide for the leg it, the, the leg guide was good it was still wobbly it bent a little bit we had a it didn't fixate great on there but it gave us much better wedge osteotomies than we were getting by doing it uh freehand um and we were able to really get much more accurate reconstructions and we looked at these we tried to overlap them 
how close were we getting at plates? We were, would get plates even sort of designed uh, for us. They weren't yet making, that's later on, but um, they would give us a printout of what the plate or what the uh, jaw should look like, and we would pre-bent the plate to that. Um, we then uh, used the uh, guys for the cutting, and we got pretty accurate, much closer than we ever were when we were doing this uh, without um, guidance. So since then, over the last 12 years, and we started this back in 2008, um, we've done well over 250 cases. We've sort of committed with all bony reconstructions towards using this technology for, for everything from malignant, benign, congenital, traumatic, surgical access cases, um, orthopedic cases when given the opportunity, pelvic and even upper extremity. Um, in the head and neck region, uh, our group has been able to get over 80% dental rehabilitation, which are rates that didn't exist before. And this is because of accuracy. This is because we're able to put the bone where the, uh, uh, where the um, uh, dentists need it for reconstruction. And um, working with a good um, prosthodontist, you can get tremendously good results. And we're even getting our malignant cases done in over 60% of the cases. So modeling to me makes complex reconstruction possible, easier and more predictable. It takes into account multiple elements at once, including osteotomies, implant positioning, and things that you can't, or at least my brain can't handle doing all at once. And we're doing this all before we walk into the operating room. Nowadays, it's almost an expectation. Even the residents are asking, oh, well, where's the plan? you know, and where are the models? And, you know, all of these things are taken care of before we go into the operating room. And the biggest thing to me is that we've got the buy-in and uh, it's taken some time, but the buy-in from the oncologic or resection surgeon. And that's made this where the reconstructive uh, component now, I think, is better than it ever has been. Um, we're able to perform more and greater amount of osteotomies for more accuracy. We're able to do primary implant placement accurately. I think once you see a plan on the screen beforehand, all of a sudden it opens up your mind. And there's many people who have done this surgery well before I have and have much more experience than I have, and they were able to make this work better than I was able to. However, I think nowadays with this technology, even less experienced people can obtain outcomes that are better. And ultimately, that's what we have to do for our patients. It can't be just the most experienced and greatest surgeons in the world that are able to do this operation. We have to make this so that everyone can do it and everyone can do it accurately. So we went through multiple generations of this. The first ones, as you saw, were very rudimentary. And then we sort of started getting into trying to provide multiple components of that in, into these uh, reconstructions, including um, dental implants. Um, and it used to be, I remember when I started training, it, we were told, well, you can't really do dental rehabilitation fibulas, you know, they don't hold implants well. Well, that's actually false. They hold implants tremendously well. It's just actually difficult for most people to get it into it, a uh, fibula, because it's all mostly cortical. So you really have to know what you're doing, but with this technology, you can plan them and place them in the operating room or you can place them afterwards um, in the dental chair. Um, and we just have become more accurate as we went along. This is just sort of showing second generation patients uh, with a jaw tumor that we're planning for resection. And here we started getting into implant placement. So we built this into the guide, double barrel segments so that we could now control better the height of the reconstruction. You can see this on the side, on the right side. We're getting up to the occlusal plane. And I think I showed you before, you know, we were placing the fibula somewhere in the middle, lower portion, very bad for dental rehabilitation. But now we're placing the bone at the occlusal plane and we're filling in the rest with double bowel segments and doing this very accurately and placing the implant in the operating room. You can see the resection. Here's the bone for the reconstruction, skin paddle, implants in place. And this is showing that with three implants. This is early on when we were doing it and um, trying to just get the best accuracy possible. Um, as we went along, the, the designs got better. 
and we got more um, demanding as far as our ability to do the reconstruction. So we tried to come up with a way of doing the reconstruction in one step, what we call the jaw in a day. And this took all the power of the, you know, multiple specialties and uh, multiple sort of uh, multiple planning sessions and bringing in different uh, companies to sort of design different parts of this. But the goal of this was to try and see, can you actually do this? give a patient the optimal outcome in a single uh, stage. And for some patients, this is actually a uh, possibility. This is a twin. This is our first patient. She was a 20-year-old female, 28-year-old female. She had a large amyloblastoma, benign but aggressive uh, local lesion from the left molar to right premolar um, uh, region. We planned for resection with guides, uh, immediate fibular reconstruction implant placement, and then an immediate screw-retained prosthesis. And this was the big leap forward for us. We had already done many patients. We had done implants, and um, obviously the uh, modeling was something that we had been using. This is the patient scan. And again, you can see where the tumor is. We could plan this. We could plan the resection. We could plan the sparing of the nerve. And we designed around all of this. This is showing the resection. This is showing the initial reconstruction and the prosthesis. And this Again, needed several companies to come together um, to help plan this. And here's the guide with the screw retained prostheses, and here's the actual prosthesis itself. This wasn't the absolute final, but it was the intraoperative prosthesis and actually lasted for several months. Um, here's the multiple models. This is just the evolution of the case, the excision of the, tu of the uh, tumor uh, from the intraoral approach only. And this is our uh, design. This has certainly changed since then, but they made these slots much more rigid for a more accurate placement of the implant because certainly degrees of change will change how um, a prosthesis can fit on or if it will fit on um, the fibula itself. This is the implants intraoperatively placed. So we placed six implants onto the fibula segments. And it was interesting because immediately in the operating room, I'm literally holding this on the towel. I took the uh, prosthesis and it fit precisely over the implants. And the prosthesis itself held the uh, bone components into position, even without a plate. But obviously we plated it and then uh, put the uh, uh, prosthesis in position. And this is actually the patient after four weeks and 48 weeks with the implants in um, their desired position, and this is her with her early prosthesis on. So why do this immediately? It restores form and function immediately, um, improves speech and swallow, provides for soft tissue support during healing, reduces overall treatment time, improves patient self-esteem, and ultimately, if you can do this in one sitting, it's actually a net cost saving. Although it, um, initially it sort of took a lot uh, to move the mountain forward, um, as these companies sort of came on board, it became easier for them to do this. Um, customized plates have been the next advance. Um, this has sort of changed accuracy to the next level. It's really actually in some ways, and I've heard my colleagues say this, it's almost too accurate. It doesn't leave much room and for human error. And basically, you know, even the wiggle and the saw will change the osteotomy just enough where the precision of the plate is so demanding that, it, you know, you, you'd need to correct for that just to fit it in place. So this is offering a new level of accuracy. Um, and they're actually tremendously strong. And you can hold the uh, jaw in place with actually a very thin, small profile plate. Um, that you just really take out of the box and put into position. So this is just uh, one of our early patients trying this, this lateral amyloblastoma. And you can see um, the defect that's going to be created, and we've already gotten used to making double bowel segments fitting the height of the jaw. And this is a plate that was designed to help hold all the pieces in place and sort of, you know, taking really a minimal uh, segment of mandible or jaw left. And in most situations, I think most surgeons would have taken off 
the rest of the, the condog because they wouldn't have even been able to plate it appropriately. But this technology, this new plating ability has allowed us to sort of be able to plate this and then come down and plate the rest of the fibula and be able to do a reconstruction. Really, there's no real replacement for a patient's own condyle. We do it when we have to, but leaving that intact is actually critical towards their functionality. This is just showing the cutting guides. This is actually reconstruction of the inferior alveolar nerve. The patient gained back sensation to their lower lip. Here's the plate in place. And now, really, what I had to do was just get the bone into position. This is just showing an actual template for the um, uh, for the bone, and this is the patient's reconstruction with implants and plates. This is him about six weeks postoperatively. Um, so this is what we call sort of the fourth generation or the current generation. Uh, with uh, and this is a patient who underwent the same jaw in a day, and this is another benign tumor. Again, this isn't necessarily for malignant tumors. You really need to sort of minimize the amount of tissue in the mouth, which goes against some of the principles of um, fistula formation and protecting the intraoral space. But when you could do this with a very closed and precise environment, you could actually get the bone in there with uh, minimal overlying soft tissue, um, put implants in place and a, a dental prosthesis. And this is just showing uh, control of the Z-axis. So in other words, it's so precise now the cutting of the fibula because it's a three-dimensional structure needs to be precise as far as the placement of the implant. So we're just holding the guide in place. And the guides have changed now. They're extraordinarily precise. There's titanium alloy guides now. So the cutting on these is um, uh, tremendously, uh, tremendously precise and guided. And here's the implants in place. This is just showing the plate design going around uh, the mental nerve. On that side, you can see we planned that into the reconstruction. And these are representing these blue circles are representing the predictive holes. So basically, we used to have to put patients into MMF, um, take them in and out of MMF to keep the condylar segments in position if possible and orient to the plate. With the cutting guides, because these fit on precisely, pressed to fit to certain portions, of the jaw, the holes that are designed uh, in these blue circles will coordinate to the plate itself. So basically, make the cuts, make the drill holes, and then you could literally take the plate and fit it on top without having to go to any intervening segment of um, uh, interosseous fixation or in, inter, in, uh, uh, intermed, uh, intermandible uh, fixation. You could just go about putting on the plate, and that will put the patient actually into orthognathic position. And again, it was a huge leap of faith to that, but this has become basically our standard and commonplace nowadays. This is the patient just with the uh, resection. Here's the fibula reconstruction with five implants in place. And then this is uh, just the drilling the prosthesis over the bone, and this is the patient intraoperatively with the uh, bone in place and the uh, prosthesis in appropriate position orientation with good occlusion. Another patient preoperatively, ameloblastoma, and again, we're doing these incisions through just per oral and external approaches, um, so we're able to do this through smaller and smaller access incisions. It makes it more difficult, but certainly gives a better aesthetic outcome. This is the uh, excision. An anterior defect in the mandible is a very difficult thing uh, to fix or repair aesthetically. But again, this technology gives us tremendous accuracy, and this is just showing a uh, patient-specific plate. And here now, we're using predictive holes, not only in the um, mandible guide, but we're using them also in the fibula. And with that, and with using these predictive holes in the fibula itself, we're now coordinating the bone from the leg to the uh, jaw. So what we were using before to help orient us, um, we're now able to do just by providing the right type of holes and 
making the guides fit from uh, leg to um, jaw. So this is the planned reconstruction with the plate. This is the resection intraoperatively. So we'll slow down. This is the plate. It's it's tremendously rigid. These plates don't move. They're they don't bend. The problem, the only problem with them is if there was some uh, change in plan, which is why you need to have the uh, resective surgeons critically on board with this. But this is um, tremendously accurate and won't change position, even though the late plates are relatively low profile. These are us drilling the implants in place, and I've come to start putting my own implants in for multiple reasons. And Here's soft tissue over the reconstruction. Here's the uh, multi-segment fibula in place, reconstructing the full height of the anterior mandible and with implants in place and ultimately providing for extraordinarily precise reconstruction, good osseous integration. And here's the patient postoperatively with good dental occlusion and I'd say very good overall prosthetic fit of the uh, jaw. Here's a patient, a 54-year-old female. This is not only for uh, the lower jaw, it's also for the maxilla. And this has also become our standard of treatment for these patients. When we're doing bony resection of the maxilla, the way I was trained, it almost always was soft tissue reconstruction. We've replaced this when there's structural integrity lost in the maxilla either through the alveolus or going up into the zygomatic region. We're, replace this with, we're replacing this with multi-segment pre-planned fibulas. This is just showing an example of a patient with an expansile lesion of the palate um, eroding and really replacing the majority of the uh, palate, alveolus, and even going up into the maxillary sinus and portion of the zygoma. This is showing it on uh, 3D imaging. Here's the planned resection with the planned fibula reconstruction. And we also designed in for implant placement within this so that we could try to do this all in one sitting. This is just not something that I would have been able to do without this technology. I think even to contemplate getting the bone into the right position would have been extreme uh, when I started in plastic surgery. But now this is sort of almost an expectation. Here's the modeling, here's the uh, incision through Weber-Ferguson and the ablation showing the large uh, resection. Um, here's the fibula with the implants in place, plated. This was uh, before our uh, patient-specific plates, but you could see the resection, subtotal palate, and here's the bony reconstruction you could see on the uh, left side mimicking the uh, planned reconstruction and this is the patient within two months post-op and you can see the palatal component of the reconstruction from uh, the fibula skin paddle this is a patient a 28 year old female who had a history of a wilms tumor at the age of eight she was actually written up by the team at memorial sloan kettering uh since Due to the rarity of the tumor, they did a resection and radiation at that time, and she fortunately has been disease-free since then. But since then, she's been using an operator. No one even thought uh, reconstruction would be an option for her. Um, but the patient has survived. It's 20 years later, and she was sent in by her oncologist uh, for reconstruction of the defect to see if there's anything that we could do. This is the patient. You can see the missing with the uh, prosthesis out, and she just had difficulty day in and day out of fitting it in, multiple changes, irritation intraorally. And again, we were taught, I was taught um, as a uh, early resident that, you know, prosthesis is a, definitely a functional part uh, of uh, jaw reconstruction, and you could ablate the maxilla and replace it with uh, a press to fit prosthesis, but it's very, very difficult for patients to handle. And certainly a patient who's in their early 20s to, to be able to have something that you don't have to put in and out every day that 
isn't a removable uh, piece of your um, uh, face and facial profile was huge for her. So we went to the drawing board. You know, she got some uh, initial orthodontics and got. Um, uh, braces put on so that we could use these for the reconstruction and we planned this like an orthognathic case so here's her uh, paddle defect and her alveolar defect and of course it wasn't just me but I did this with my craniofacial and oral surgery colleagues and uh, this is just showing the movements that were needed for a hemi Lafort one segment and once that was put into position, then we needed to put the fibula into position. This is showing all the cutting apparatus that would be created to help make the moves and the stepwise positions. Here's the plate, and this is the fibula segment that I had to fit in uh, into position. And these were the plates that were designed to help hold the left maxilla into place and to allow for fitting of the uh, fibula into position with it, uh, several implants. This is the uh, printed design, and here's the um, plate design uh, that was patient specifically made for her. Here's the cutting guides. This is the uh, interdental uh, fixation that was help, uh, used to help hold the jaw in place prior to the plating. And I'd say we'd even advance from this. This is the fibula segment with three um, implants and the prosthesis intraoperatively positioned. And this is her now two years later. Much improved overall position. She doesn't have, she has a fixed retained prosthesis at this time. She has excellent facial um, fullness and position. And you can see that screw retained prosthesis in place. It's not just for fibulas. This is just showing a patient with a scapula flap, 71 year old female, who, as you can see, has had multiple resections. She's had over five resections of tumor. She comes in now with a fungating lesion. And she has difficulty walking. The best option has been scapula. And this helps us visualize the scapula. I've actually changed scapula design based off of three-dimensional imaging of the scapula. And we actually needed to make a three-segment component out of it, but this helped to show the design. Here's the plating system. This is the patient on the table with the resection, tumor resection. Here's the scapula plan. We need a lot of soft tissue. We took it as a, a very chimeric uh, piece. So there's a segment of uh, scapula, parascapula, latissimus, and um, the scapula bone that we took inclusive of the angular and um, circumflex uh, system. And we were able to osteotomize green stick this in the desired fashion, showing it fitting into position. Um, we needed extra outflow. This is just showing the um, cephalic vein turnover for the reconstruction, but you could see um, the latissimus component, which we used. She's been radiated, so once this was opened and positioned, she needed intraoral filling, neck filling, and that's what the uh, latissimus was used for, and the parascapula scapula component was used intraorally along with the bony fixation. This is her immediately post-op. Iliac crest, the same. Uh, we've used this on a number of occasions for the iliac crest, and it even changed the design of the, uh, uh, of the uh, reconstruction based off of the imaging showing a curvature within the crest that was not favorable for the side of surgery that was done, so helping us to either switch it to the other side or to switch it to another bony reconstruction. This is a patient with uh, squamous cell carcinoma adjacent to the skin requiring intra and extra oral um, resection. This is the planned fibula at the point of the uh, iliac crest that fit in appropriately with the um, mandibular resection itself. This is the design of the resection and the skin paddle for the reconstruction. And this is just showing the components of the 
resection, reconstruction, you can see the iliac thrust in place. Um, this is the um, internal oblique and the cutaneous paddle. The oblique was used for the intraoral coverage and the cutaneous paddle for the extraoral and partial intraoral. And again, without this technology and without this planning, I don't think that uh, for me these operations would be technically uh, doable, at least to the level that they are done or that we're doing it uh, today. This is a patient scan post-op. Thank you very much for your time. I'm happy to answer any questions if you have. Jamie, thank you so much. Uh, really a, a very convincing, I think, argument that uh, these virtual surgical planning basically allows you to get a precision that you would otherwise not be able to get in these cases. So as someone who doesn't do these cases, uh, my practice is almost exclusively obviously below the head and neck. Um, I, I can, I'm certainly very convinced that this is uh, clearly a, um, a better way to do it if you're looking for precision. I think the question that <clears throat> whenever there's new technology that makes things uh, not only more precise, but potentially even easier, the question is always, uh, from a philosophical standpoint, if we think that residents should only be trained in this, um, or if residents should also be trained in the old-fashioned way, just in case when they go out there and they're trying to do this stuff, if they aren't able to, you know, get the high-tech solutions, what are your thoughts on that? That's a that's a really great question. I'm sort of watching that um, in so many different areas. You know, I walk into the OR and I'm watching robotic surgery, and I'm seeing residents either scrubbed in, helping with the placement of the instruments, or they're sitting on the side or at the assist camera, and many of them aren't really getting to operate even on that device. Even when I was doing laparoscopic surgery, eventually I got to do the laparoscopic surgery, but I'm watching the robot, and I, and I don't know where that's going to take people, you know, if you're really trained and all these minimally invasive um, specialties, can you still do the open operation? I guess that's what we're all sort of battling with. I think yeah. in the case of the fibula, we're still doing the same sort of fibula dissection. The thing that's being taken out of the equation for that is the, the whittling or the eyeballing. Right. And, you know, um, I mean, I've had great opportunity to speak to Doc, you know, someone like Dr. Fu Chen Wei, who doesn't need this. You know, he doesn't need this. I mean, I could say or think that if he saw this, he might believe that it may be something fun to use or give him the ability to do something even more complex with his reconstructions. But he's so skilled and capable and has done so many that he could do it without this. But, you know, accuracy, even for me, having done it. 10 years, 8 to 10 years, sort of without this uh, technology and feeling that I had sort of had the operation pretty much down. I'd done maybe a few hundred of them. I still, there was no question that the accuracy and my ability to do this expediently, um, accurately uh, wasn't improved with it. But could a resident coming out, a resident coming out today with this technology and appropriate planning I think could do a much, much better job than I was ever able to do without this mm -hmm. um, and do it as good as I can do <clears throat> with this technology. If they didn't have this to depend on, could they figure out how to do it? Yeah, it may be a little bit more difficult, but mm -hmm. I think, you know, I think it's still worth it in the long run because I think it's ultimately going to give the patients the better outcome. Yeah, no, I would definitely agree with that. And it's the same kind of philosophical question about any new technology that makes things faster or easier um, with regards to the fallback option. And I think, you know, for example, you know, coupling a vein versus hand sewing a vein, the coupler clearly is a great device that, you know, many people use. And um, But, you know, the question is, you know, what if the coupler isn't amenable to whatever you're sewing in the vein? Can you sew a vein otherwise? It's kind of a similar type, um, type question there. Yeah. No, um, it, and, and it's true. I mean, we have to literally, you know, we have to like make our residents sort of sew the vein every now and then. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, definitely. You know, 
So uh, we had a couple of questions um, in the yep. comment section that I'll, I'll read off for you. Um, one of them was about, you know, when you do your your jaw in a day, uh, how do you place a skin paddle over the neoalveolus? Would the additional height um, affect the implants uh, and the prosthesis placement, or do you just kind of allow it to, that part to mucosalize um, and you don't need a skin paddle at all? Great question. So this is where it's really specific. It's really very isolated, the patients that you could do this on. And truthfully, I, you know, um, I think it's pretty much for benign diseases um, where you're resecting pretty much bone and tooth only. Gingiva, for the most part, is being left over. I always take a small skin paddle with me with the intent of, uh, if, first, first of all, if, if there's if it's not what I expect intraorally, um, in other words, if the gingival defect is more than what I'm comfortable with, at least I have that skin paddle to fall back on. If I don't need it, then I could take it off and I could use the fascial component. So usually what mm -hmm. I'll try to do is put the fascial component along with the gingival over it, slide that under the prosthesis, but around the implants itself. And to date, it's been functional as far as sort of like protecting the reconstruction. In most patients, if you ask the prosthodontists or um, people who do the ultimate uh, prosthetic reconstruction, they pretty much want mucosa on implant. Like they want less mm -hmm. tissue for them is better. So, you know, we try to set it up for that um, when we were doing those cases. But again, we're making very isolated access in the neck. We're just literally making enough room to do anastomosis. So I'm talking about like, you know, creating sort of orocutaneous fistulas. You know, um, I would not do this in a uh, malignant head and neck case. You know, there were, you know, where the neck has been wide open, where the mouth is wide open, there's tissue loss. You really have to seal the intraoral component from the neck. Otherwise, disaster is awaiting you. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Now, what do you, where do you think this is going? I mean, with 3D technology becoming, or 3D printing technology becoming cheaper and cheaper every year, do you see busy medical centers like NYU and Sloan Kettering and MD Anderson just internalizing this and, and basically have a 3D printer that they're able to use kind of in-house in to essentially reduce the cost for themselves? Do you, do you see this going that way? I think it can. I really think it can, you know, and, and if you take it away, you know, where, you know, if you look at the um, plating world, we're a very small segment of it. We're mm -hmm. like the step, you know, the stepchildren in uh, these bigger striker or synthes, all these companies, because, you know, orthopedics, I mean, you're aware of it, you know, stuff that you use for um, uh, upper and lower extremity, even stuff that's used for cranial or, or um, spine surgery. That's where the real big money is made. Um, I mean, certainly those companies are not going to want us to be able to uh, to do that. But, uh, you know, I could see where in the future that there's some form of, because the, the technology is there. It's getting there. You know, we're able to plate, print plates. That was science yeah. fiction to me, you know, 10 years ago. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I think that that technology will, you know, become broadened i think you know more and more places should be able to do that and you could almost see where you know uh consortiums or mom and pop shops if they have that ability and technology could um uh go about you know doing it themselves all they need really is a software input to do that so i do think it's coming to that how it's going to play out i'm not sure i could see where the uh the companies have sort of um, made it so it's becoming more difficult to do it because it's becoming more and more complex and the designs are more and more complex. But I think, you know, I think that's going to equilibrate over time. Right. That makes sense. And then the last I mean, one... a lot of the companies, what they offer is really the engineering. You know, right. that's what they're offering that we don't have. Right. Yeah, that, that's a really good point. And the last question I have is, um, you know, I think there's obviously... A, a sweet spot with regards to adoption of new technologies with regards to how senior someone is. Clearly, 
you know, f new trainees coming out of practice are obviously being trained with this stuff. But when someone in practice, I think someone like you is in the sweet spot where you're, you have experience doing it the old fashioned way, but you're still young enough to, to not be set in your ways so much that you don't want to adopt something new. I think that the the senior senior surgeons, I think, are you know a lot of them probably feel that it's a waste of time and money. Um, yeah. And I, I wonder, have you gotten you know pushback from that standpoint? I think I can certainly see someone who's been doing this for you know 30 years saying, ah, you know, you don't you don't do this stuff. I can do it just as well, just freehand it. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah. Well, it's it, it's it's a great question. You know, it's I guess I've seen two bumps of this. I remember starting in very well when I was in medical school coming into um, general surgery and it was really re kind of the beginnings of laparoscopic surgery. And I saw these sort of well-established, very capable um, uh, general surgeons who were struggling with this technology and they mm -hmm. really did think it was stupid, but they saw that they needed to because everyone else around them or at least the younger people were doing and it was becoming it was enough of a movement where they had no choice and the public was calling for it so it was a very hard evolution for them um, even though they could quote unquote do it in an open fashion but you know anyone that's seen an open gallbladder versus a laparoscopic gallbladder would probably say I think you know yeah this is, you know I'll, I'll take that laparoscopic anytime um, but, uh, you know, the, in, when we started doing this, those were the, there was a lot of questions. The questions were, well, in my place, you know, we're doing this or that, and, uh, you know, we can't tell if, you know, the surgeon is going to be able to cut out the tumor that way. Well, I mean, I think we've shown, I've, I can't remember the last case that we've had to go back to re-resect the tumor because we've, um, because we haven't planned it right, because we were getting scans that are really relatively timely, close right. to the time of surgery, and we're um, kind of over planning the resection because we're able to plan in the reconstruction very precisely. So um, those are the questions. The questions were, well, you know, what's the cost? And the cost is, you know, sort of something that got worked out. Of course, you know, the companies always figure out how to make their money uh, from these uh, uh, procedures, but the save time in the operating room and everything else, I think, um, sort of could easily justify that. And I think the last was, you know, um, you know, uh, there became a demand. I mean, there became, beyond us doing it, other people started doing it. Residents started learning how to do it. More and more people found that the accuracy and the uh, reconstructive outcome became um, better and easier and more and more people have adopted it. and it's almost become more like the gold standard in a way as opposed to the uh, the orphan or the stepchild in, in this type of reconstruction so you know it doesn't mean you have to go to a jaw in the day or put implants in at the same time um, but I think getting the bone in the right position so that someone can in the future, I think, you know, people started recognizing, and I think the public starts recognizing once they see that it's out there that um, they started asking for it. Yeah. Now, um, I told you that was the last question, but I but I know it's very late over there. I just got a great question texted to me, actually, by a dear friend. Yeah. Um, so this has to do with more of the, the kind of the psychological well-being of the patients. You've shown that this kind of jaw in a day idea is possible. And I would have to think that the patients and you know before and after this was available, have you noticed an improvement in this patient's psychological well-being when you can get those dental implants done kind of at the same time and just be on your way to essentially functioning and being more normal? Yeah, I, I, you know, I, I think it's a weird thing, you know, and this this gets back to you know I remember you know even in training, you know, living with quote unquote, the defect, you know, uh, yeah. there's the whole concept of someone coming in with a Mohs defect and just sort of leaving it, letting it heal. So they kind of know what the defect is. They know what they're dealing with and then coming about reconstructing it. I mean, we don't necessarily do that much anymore, but patients that had had that, they don't realize all the stuff <laughs> that they would be missing or that they would have to go through to have gotten what they got almost in one day. 
Right. Um, so I think that they have become almost like normal people. The questions or the things that they're asking for is almost like an aesthetic patient, right? It's like, <laughs> oh, you know, this isn't fitting right up here, or can we fix that? Or, you know, never mind the fact, you know, do you think you could ever get like implants? And they're, you know, they're talking about the ultimate adjustment or refinement. So I think that it does help just like breast reconstruction or anything else, immediate breast reconstruction, it helps the psychological factor. But on the other end of it, it probably makes them not realize like how complex or how sort of unique a reconstruction they've actually had. Yeah, so it's a double-edged sword for sure, it sounds like. Well, I, I, yeah. think it's, I think it's a good thing if you can. Yeah. Well, well, Jamie, um, thank you so much again for um, taking the time to give us a, a really phenomenal talk. I'm really excited about this talk being in our library because I think it's uh, something that everyone should know about and everyone should see um, what's possible out there. And I know it's very late um, East Coast time, but I know you, you're you always um, up late and, and uh, working <laughs> late and up very early in the morning. So thank you so much. Hey, my Honestly, my pleasure. I hope it was okay. I hope you guys enjoyed it. There's a lot more to this. You know, we, we've expanded into other areas and other types of complexity. But again, it gets a little long in the tooth if you just keep going on about it. But um, I really appreciate the time and hopefully you guys enjoyed. Uh, really, any uh, happy looking, to do it. No, thanks. And we're looking forward to hopefully being able to host you here in person at some point. I would That'd love be a lot to. of fun. Great. It would be great. Say hi to all, all of right. our friends at NYU and uh, we'll definitely I be in touch. Thanks, Jamie. Thanks. Right. Jamie, thank you very much. Thanks, Rick. Thank you very much.